It's all good. It's all good. But man, I'm just I'm so happy to be here and uh, getting to, getting started on a, on a new message series tonight. And what a beautiful beautiful day. I was you know I was talking about to Tanner a minute ago, right? So Tanner, one of the things I do with Tanner, I love this guy. Is um, this is probably terrible too. You can pray for me. I rub it in. He lives in Greencastle, Indiana. Like, there's no mass exodus to, to go retire in Greencastle. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's horrible there. It's, it's freezing cold. It's snow. Like, the other day, he sent me a, a, mess, a video of it. It's, it's still snowing at his house. It's, it's April, y'all. And it's snowing. He's got snow. He, and, he, and he's like, he's got that, like, Eeyore voice when he sends me the video. Like, oh, it's beautiful out here. Aren't you jealous? You know? And I just dig right back. And I'm, I'll send him a video of the beautiful sky. I'm like, yeah, it's brutal here, too, man. I, you know, when I was riding my motorcycle to work, I had to put on like a windbreaker because it's chilly, you know. I just really like to dig it in on him, but I am, I'm blessed. I love living here, man. Does anyone else love, I love living here. I, I praise God. I get to live where everyone wants to vacation. Man, it's the best place on the planet. I've been all over the country when I, when I was traveling uh, on, a, on a golf tour. I used to do that. This, I was a golf referee. It's kind of crazy. But I, I would travel all over the country, and I've been to a lot of beautiful places, right? But I love Florida. And I love specifically right here. Not only do I enjoy it, but I feel a strong call of God right here. Like, this is where I'm supposed to be. Yes. Okay? And so I love it here. And getting to ride my motorcycle, like, all year, man, that's the best, isn't it? You get to, it's freezing out. People are shoveling snow. And I got Meredith on the back, and we're cruising out to Winter Garden to have coffee. I mean, I love it out here. And it was another just Brutal, awful day out there today again, wasn't it? Just awful. Oh, just awful. 80-something degrees, not a cloud in the sky. I love it. Been all over this country, but this is my favorite place to be. And Lord willing, I'll get to live here for a long, long time. I've, a couple places I haven't been to, though. I've never been to the Pacific Northwest. Anyone ever been out there, like Seattle and stuff like that? That's kind of nice, right? Lots of good coffee. Except it rains every day all the time is what I understand. Just cold and chilly, but good coffee. So it kind of balances out. I've never been to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Anyone ever been there? I have never. I've heard that is like, like Alaska kind of beautiful, right? Just like gorgeous. Never been there either. One of the places I'd love to be that I've never been is out to Yellowstone. Anyone ever been out to Yellowstone? Beautiful out there. I've never been out there either. Yellowstone's sort of a, a huge place, this, this national park. And it's, it covers, it, it, the, the state kind of, spreads out until I think like three different states but there's one place over in Yellowstone in Wyoming and and in Wyoming it, you'll see this uh, there's this this big <laughs> old faithful geyser this 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 big steam and water that comes out of that little mound of dirt right there and and it's a popular popular thing um, it's a I did some research on this old faithful this week, and uh, did you know that it, it, it comes out like every hour and a half? Every hour and a half or so, you know, within a couple of minutes, but about every hour and a half, all of a sudden, this thing comes alive, and it's not just smoldering, all of a sudden you see this. This is what starts to happen. It just starts to gush out and it'll shoot up like, you know, 10, 20 feet up in the air, 30 feet up in the air. It's, it's just a, it's a sight to see. It's pretty awesome. I'd love to be able to go out there and see it, and, and from what I, I gather from studying, there's like hundreds of thousands of people every single year make the trip out to go see this spout of water and steam come out of the ground. And, and, and it's, it's, it's very reliable. It's just every hour and a half it happens all the time. And, and when, I was, when I was watching this and I was thinking about this, it reminded me of my first message that I ever preached. The first me and, I, and I dug into all my files and I found my first message that I ever preached. And it was on March 15th, 2005. And here it is. It's pretty cool. And uh, talking about Old Faithful. My first message that I ever preached was about Chevy Chase in the movie Vacation. Yeah? Yeah. It's a good movie, right? 
And this poor guy, man, he gets in the car and he takes his family. He's a good dude. He takes his family all the way across the country to Wally World. Remember that? Yep. And he gets there and he walks up to this little moose and there's a little sign and he presses the button and it says, sorry folks, park's closed. <laughs> and he melts down, man, punches that thing right in the face, drops a couple of choice words. It's totally not like Old Faithful. See, Old Faithful is never closed. Old Faithful continues to show off what he does every hour and a half. There's no such thing as, sorry folks, park's closed. It happens all the time. Unlike Chevy Chase, he couldn't, he couldn't organize a trip based on this park because the park was like run by humans and it was not of God, it was just a park. And so you base the trip and you fail. But because this thing is faithful, you can base the trip on it. You can adjust your calendar around this thing and you can spend resources on it and go and finish the trip. And it's successful because it's faithful. And it's beautiful for sure. It's, it's definitely beautiful. I would love to see it. But that's not its most prominent feature. Its prominent feature is that it's faithful and hence its name, Old Faithful. And I would just tell you this, that the number of people that visit this thing, it kind of tells us something. I don't know if it tells you something, but it told me something. When I was reading this and, and checking out the stats, I was amazed at how many people go and see this. What it told me is that we desire to experience faithfulness. We do. We want to see something that is faithful. And uh, we're in a world that's not anything like that, right? Nothing. We have, uh, we have friends that let us down. And we have family members that let us down. And we have companies that we work for 30 years and we're working for a retirement. And they say, oh, the pensions are canceled. And we have teams that we put all of our, 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 our resources in, whether we're buying all their memorabilia or their, their gear or their tickets or we're gambling or whatever it is we're doing. And they let us down too. Our country lets us down. Our politicians let us down. Our friends let us down. Our moms and dads let us down. Maybe you're the one who lets somebody down. Pastors and teachers let people down. They disappoint us. Their word means nothing. It's rampant in our world. But maybe you're the person who let somebody down. Maybe you're not very, very faithful. So I was thinking about marriage. It's the last bastion of hope in relational faithfulness. Because it's the only relationship where someone or two people get up, husband and wife get up, and they make a commitment right here. They're not just like mom and dad with their kids. No one makes a marriage covenant with a kid. You just have them. No one goes up to your friend and says, Paul, I swear on my life and on this, and I'm going to be your... Like, nobody does this. But in marriage, we, that's our last bastion of hope. We're gonna, it's going to be different in this because we're committed to this relationship. Right? Do me a favor. You have a smartphone? Do you have a smartphone? Hold up your smartphone. Come on now. You all have smartphones. Hold up your smartphone. Okay. Go to Google. Y'all are standing there looking at me. What are y'all looking at me for? Pick up your phone and go to Google, right? <laughs> and type in this. You ready? Yeah. Y'all ready there? Yeah. You ready? You ready? You ready? Top reasons for divorce 2017. What's it say? What's your number one result? Boom. Unfaithfulness. The number one reason that this last bastion of hope, of committed relationship, the number one reason why it fails is because of unfaithfulness. And I think, and I believe, that it's true that all of us have been dented and bruised and hurt, beaten up by the wounds of unfaithfulness. 
And I think that those wounds are lingering. And I think that those wounds that linger have a profound impact on your current relationship with other people and with God. I do. And so I've been impressed of the Lord to start a new series this week. A series that should dull the pain of unfaithfulness wounds and introduce you to someone that will never let you down. Do me a favor with one loud voice. What's the name of this message series? Faithful. No, no, that wasn't one voice. That was this nothing voice. Let's hear it. Faithful. So I want to start this week with a setup. I want to build some framework that we can build upon for the next six or seven weeks. And so I want to start tonight with just some theology. Do you know what theology is? It's a study of God, right? Like biology, and this is theology. This is the study of God. And uh, we're going to start with that. And in this series, though, as we move forward, we're going to visit some, some mountaintop characters in the Scriptures and some huge, massive mountaintop stories in the Scriptures. And, and they're famous stories. And, and let me, if you've been in church, like, since you were born... You're going to hear about this stuff. And if you've never been, is there anyone in this church here right now that's never been to church before? That this is the first time ever? Never? Okay. If you were, you probably still heard of the people that we're going to talk about in this series. Mountaintop stories in Scripture. But here's the thing. Sometimes these stories have such unbelievable miracles and such that it kind of trumps, these miracles trump the true story of the entire Bible, which is not a story of incredible miracles. It's a story of God's faithfulness. Amen. That's what the Bible is. Amen. So here's a little about what the scriptures say about God and his faithfulness. Here's a few verses. You can just jot down the references. But 1 Corinthians 1.9 says that God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 10.13, God is faithful. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, the Lord is faithful. 1 John 1.9, He is faithful. The 1, John, 1 Corinthians 1.9, though, that's the one that really clarifies what His faithfulness really is. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.9 that God is faithful to do what He says. That's what faithful is. Someone who will do what they say they're going to do. Jesus would say, let your yea be yea, let your nay be nay. Like, if it's yes, it's yes. If it's no, it's no. And, and, and so I find it helpful in, in, in my experience that if we're going to talk about, like, one word a lot, we need to get a definition of the word so we understand what it is. And so when you look up a word in the dictionary, you know, usually there's, like, here's the word and there's a sentence that tells you what it means, correct? Yeah. It's not like that with the faithful. Faithful is a weird word because there's no sentence that describes faithful. If you look up faithful, you see a bunch of synonyms to try to get your mind to understand what it really, really means. You see them there on the screen. So if you take notes, which is awesome, that means, hey, God, I mean business here. I'm serious about what you're doing here in my life. I want to know this stuff. I want to remember this stuff. I want to go back through it this week. You'd write these things down. Faithful means loyal. It means constant, steadfast, devoted, unswerving, dedicated, committed, trustworthy, dependable, reliable. Man, don't we need that? We, 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 we need more of that. We, 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 listen, I, I'm a pastor, and I, I, I preach the Bible, so my number one job is to share theology with you. Like, I get that. And I want to do that, and I'm going to do it tonight. And every time we gather, as long as the Lord would have me have breath and a, and a beating heart, that's what I'm going to do. But listen, we, we don't necessarily need more theology. You know, we, we need more of that. You know what I'm saying? We need more of, of what you see on the screen. You know, if, if you get a head full of information, that's awesome. But if it doesn't flesh out into this, it's worthless. We need more godly character, right? And so, 
as we examine his faithful nature through this study, I believe that God's goal in this is twofold. I believe that God, first and foremost, he would want us to trust him at a greater level. He would want us to experience his faithfulness. And because of his faithfulness, we would be able to trust in him in more things more often at a deeper level. It is not just a God that's some ethereal being or some theory, but that he's real. And you can see tangible evidence that he is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. That's deep, meaningful, passionate relationship with the Lord as real as if I'm standing here right now. That's what he wants. He wants you to trust in him at a greater level. But the second thing is this, is that we would display a greater level of faithfulness. So one is that he would want us to trust in God more. And the second thing is that others would be able to trust in us more. Because I can tell you that one of the great pains in ministry is when people don't say what they're going to do. I mean, when they say they're going to do it and they don't. It, it, you get it all the time. And it's not just ministry, I know. In your job, in your families, in your relationships, everywhere you go is unfaithfulness. Everywhere. It's a cancer in our culture. And that's not who God is. It's not who God is at all. He wants us to trust in Him more, and He wants other people to trust in us more because, follow me, Christ followers what? Follow Christ. So let's start here. God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. Here's some verses. Here's what God's word says. Jeremiah 1.12 says, I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Guess what God's doing right now? Watching. He's an active God. He didn't just create a universe and create a people and say, all right, good luck. No, he's watching right now. It says that his eyes go back and forth across the earth looking to strengthen those whose hearts are completely his. So he's looking for devoted followers of his. He's looking for that right now. It says that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. So what's he doing right now? He's building his church. How's he doing that? He's seeking that which is lost right now. If you're lost, if you're not saved and you're in this building, it's because he brought you here and he's coming after your heart tonight. Amen. That's what he's here to do. Hallelujah. He's active. And he says right here, I'm watching. I'm looking. I said some things and I'm watching my world. And I'm making sure that when I said something, it's going to happen. And if you throw a wrench at me, because we have free will, you could do some stuff. He's like, you can do all you want, buddy, but I'm going to get it done. Yeah. He's a, he is the master getter dunner. That's who God is. He gets stuff done. He's watching to make sure that his word is fulfilled. Here's another one. Ezekiel 12, 28. Whatever I say will be fulfilled. I love that. Who could speak like that? Who could say... You can count on it. Like with absolute assurance, none of us can say this. I, I mean, I, I, I think I'm a decent dad, but I, I let my kids down, right? You ever promise your kids you're going to go do something with them and you have great intentions, right? We do. We all do. And then sometimes just things happen, right? And you, you got to put it off. It's not that you're wicked. It's just that things happen. Yeah, that doesn't happen with God. Ever. If he says he's going to do it, guess what? It gets done. That's God. Who can, who can really say honestly, with complete sincerity, that God's ever failed them? I mean, who, we could go up and down the aisle here and ask, who could say that God has ever really failed them? And I'm not talking about some God that you conjured up in your mind, created in the image of man. No, I'm talking about the God of the Bible. I'm talking about the God of, 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 of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Moses and, and Joshua and, and Joseph. The God of Isaiah. The God of, of, of Peter and of John. The, the one who split the Red Sea. You know, the one who walked on the water. The one who, who calmed the storm. The one who raised himself from the dead. That God. What, who could say that, that that God has ever failed to do something that he promised? No one, no one can. No one can. Amen. Ever. 
This is, this is what Joshua said of this God. He said, deep in your hearts, you know that every promise of the Lord your God has come true. Not a single one has failed. Who can say that about anyone else? No one. Do me a favor. you got to go to Numbers. Way back, way, way back. This is the book that everyone says is super boring, right? It's not boring. Go to Numbers chapter 23 with me. Numbers chapter 23. This is, this is old stuff. Right? This, is, this, is, this is like, this is Moses stuff. Way, 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 way back. First five books of the Bible. So, so in chapter 23, verse 19, this is, what it's, this is what it says. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He's not a human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Of no one else could such a claim be made. In all of the universe, in all of time, no claim of any other person could ever be made than, than of the Lord. He is truly unique and different than all other people. Some are better than others. But who could say that he has never lied and he's always fulfilled his word? Nobody else. He is worthy to be worshipped because of this. He is unique and powerful and beautiful. You can count on him. You can rely on him. All the time. <sighs> Another aspect of God's faithfulness that, that absolutely needs to be mentioned is this. Is that time doesn't impact or change God's faithfulness. Time has no bearing on Him. You know, we all change. I change. You change. You change. Everyone changes. Some people complain because you ain't changed enough. Well, you might, you might, they might complain about you, but you just look at them and say, well, I might not be all that I should be, but I'm not all I used to be. Amen. You can tell them that. And, and maybe we need to be changed even more into the image of Jesus. I get it. And we all change, but sometimes we don't change for the good. Sometimes in our process of becoming more like Jesus, we still make some stupid moves, right? I'm guilty. We all make stupid moves. And, and so we, we, we change for the better, but sometimes we change our mind for ourselves, and we let people down that's just what we do too often but Joshua says look at God's perfect record go back and see his perfect record not a single one of his promises has ever failed ever can you say that but the psalmist also says in Psalm 119.90, your faithfulness endures to all generations. Joshua says, look back. And the psalmist says, look forward. Same God. And people always say, listen, what happened in the past is in the past. It's in the rearview mirror. Don't, don't think about it. Just forget about it. I get what they're saying, but sometimes we have to look back. Sometimes we have to look back and see the faithfulness of God. If, you look, if I look over the landscape of my life, it... it Come on, right? Like, I can't believe some of the stuff he's pulled with me. And, and I start thinking about today, and get in preparation for this, I start thinking about his faithfulness before I became a Christian. Right. That I am even standing here right now, alive or in prison for life is a miracle. Amen. You know what I'm saying? He is faithful. And I need to look back and see the things that he's done so that I can trust him with the things I got coming. That's what we're supposed to do. So that's why Joshua says, hey, look back. Just remember all he's done in your life. He's faithful. He made some promises. He delivered. Did he ever fail a single one of them? So why would you think, the psalmist says, why would you think he would now? He's faithful. And his faithfulness endures through every generation. So the psalmist said this of God. Listen to what God says of himself in Malachi 3.6. For I, the Lord, do not change. He says, moving forward, I'm the same God I was. All, listen, all these years 
When you look through here and you see what I've done, I'm that same God right now. That's what he says of himself. And Jesus Christ, God in flesh, the only person who could claim the same thing. Jesus Christ, Matthew 13, 8, he says, hey, I don't change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing changes about me. Past, present, and future, always faithful, always reliable. I said it. I'll do it. You can believe it. That's God. Now, here's some more truth. Are you ready for this one? Yeah. I don't think you're ready for this one. Yeah. Doesn't sound like you're ready for this yeah. one. You have to pull it out of me better than that, man. You guys got to participate in this. I'll sit down right now. You guys got to get me going here. Come on. Come on. You want to hear some truth? Okay, listen. God's faithfulness doesn't rely on you. You should be exhaling. You ready? <sighs> Isn't that good? It doesn't rely on you. Listen, if anyone makes a claim about God, you should ask them this. Bible and uh, I need a, 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 a chapter and a verse, please. Chapter and a verse? Chapter and a verse? Anyone want to hear a chapter and a verse? Yeah. Chapter and a verse, please. Okay, 2 Timothy 2.13. Thank you for asking. It tells us that if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Listen, this is why. Listen, that's awesome. That's truth. That's awesome. But there's a reason why. For he cannot deny himself. He says, even if you are totally faithless, if you do not do as I want. If you don't believe in me the way I want you to believe in me, even if you let me down big time, that's not who I am. That might be who you are. That might be who you are. Or you. Or you. Or you. But I'm not that way. He's like, I'm, I'm a faithful guy. I'm a faithful God. And so I can't deny who I am. That's just who I am, y'all. It doesn't matter what you do. This is what I'm going to do. And so I'm not going to be impacted by what you do. We are not this way at all. I mean, let's just, let's just admit, like, honesty in church, right? Generally speaking, aren't our choices, like, don't they, don't, doesn't what other people do weigh heavily upon what we do? Let's, yeah, all of us. Come on now. Raise your hand. A lot of us are, are geared that way. What other people do impact what we will do in response, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons, like, this is a little bit out of context, but you get the idea. John the Baptist said, hey, we need less of me and more of him. Amen. Like, I, we, we are not the way we're supposed to be. God is faithful. We can be faithless. We need to be like him. So he's like, yeah, you, don't be like me. Less of me, more of him. We need to be more like Jesus. I love this um, when, when, when the Jewish nation was, was like after Solomon, there was a, a division in the, in the nation, you know. It was a split kingdom. And there was, you know, Israel was up here, and then there was Judah down below. And um, there were several prophets of God that were speaking on his behalf in that time. One of the guys that was speaking for him was a, a guy, and a lot of people don't really know much about him, but his name is Hosea. And... Hosea, it's an interesting read. If you'd like to read uh, his story, uh, you can read. There's a, there's a book in the Bible named after him. And, and he, God used him to display, I think, personally, probably the greatest display of God's faithfulness was uh, on display in Hosea's life. He said, I want you to go. You know, let, I don't want to do that. Let me, let me just read it to you. Let me just, and if you have your Bible, you can go there and you can read it. My vision is terrible here. I'm going to try to get there. But um, I gotta, somebody hold it for me back there, would you? <laughs> so I'm going to read you the, the opening line of the, of the book. It's, it's pretty awesome. He says, um, when the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. Now, who wants to hear that one? Whew. Yeah, you think you got it tough at home. Just remember that one. But you don't understand my wife. Yeah, is she a prostitute? No, shut up. Go marry a prostitute. 
so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. So not just, not just that she's going to be unfaithful, but she's going to have some kids for some other men. And I want you to take care of them. What? <laughs> this will illustrate how Israel, his people, which is point to them. Yeah, point, point to me. Yeah. <laughs> This will illustrate how God's people have acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. See, we're unfaithful, but God is faithful, and he wants Hosea to be faithful to the woman who's unfaithful to display his faithfulness to our, un our unfaithfulness. Get it? He's faithful, and we're unfaithful. So he has the faithful one marry the unfaithful one to display how the faithful one is faithful to the unfaithful. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's on YouTube. So here, here in Hosea chapter 6, verse 3, this is how Hosea describes this faithfulness. You know, he said, John says, you know, less of me, more him, right? We got to get to know him. He needs to be magnified. I need to be less because I'm not faithful. He's super faithful. Look, he says, oh, that we might know the Lord. That let us press on to know him. Why, why do we want to get to know the Lord more? Why would we want to get to know the Lord greater? Because he's, he's faithful. Someone's listening. <laughs> Listen, he says, that we might know the Lord, let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as surely as the arrival of the dawn. Amen. Or the coming of rains in early spring. Amen. See, he's, he's using pictures of nature to describe the nature of, God, of himself. And, and, and he is like, who, who, except for the weird like, Guy who's at home packing up guns and ammo for the end times. You know, the sun might not, it not coming up tomorrow. It's good. Listen, but the normal guy, he's not sitting at home going, you know, I got to work tomorrow, but I wonder if the sun's coming up. Right? Everyone, you know that it's been coming up since the beginning. It's coming up. Is, is the sun coming up tomorrow? Unless the Lord Jesus rips the sky open. Is the sun coming up tomorrow? Yes. yes. Everyone knows that that is faithful. And that's like God. He's coming. He's coming. If he said he's going to do something, he's going to come to you as sure as the sun is going to crack open over that horizon. That's who he is. That's who he is. You can trust him. You can rely on him. You can depend on him. He's faithful. And this... Right here, what's coming right now, to me, this is the most exciting part. Because this is the anchor that ensures that God will always be faithful to you. Paul let us have a little glimpse of it in 1 Corinthians 1.9, where he says he cannot deny himself. Psalm 23.3, he restores my soul and guides me on the path of righteousness. Why? For his namesake for his namesake right psalm 25 11 for your namesake O lord pardon my iniquity Amen. psalm 31 3 for your namesake you will lead and guide me do you see all the things this is just a short list but look restoring my soul guiding me in the path of righteousness pardoning my iniquity like saving me forgiving me right leading me and guiding me in my everyday life these are good things who wants that we all want that, right? That's awesome. But why is he doing this? Right. He's, everyone wants to teach about the love of God. And yes, listen, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. I get he loves you. But that's not the motivating factor for why he's loving on you. He's loving on you for his namesake, not yours. Amen. You're nothing and I'm nothing. He's everything. His reputation's on the line. He will not be spoiled. His plans will not be thwarted. His name will not be dragged through the mud. He is God of gods and he's going to win. 
And so he's never going to fail at anything. And if that means hooking you up to show that he's awesome, that's a, listen, that's not the reason. That's the byproduct of his faithfulness to who? Himself. He's the only one who's allowed to be an egomaniac because he's God. He's entitled to it. And we're not. We're not. Listen, I want to show you something. Do me a favor. We're actually almost done. Bring up on the screen right here. This is Isaiah chapter 48. Can you all see that? That's my Bible. So you can, that's a little bit of my study this week. It's an awesome section of scripture. Everyone thinks that God loves him. Love, 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 love. And he's doing all this stuff because he loves you. Awesome. He loves you. I get it. But you've got to carefully study the scriptures to understand the nature and character of Almighty God. Why he's doing things. So what you see there is my Bible, and you see pink and you see yellow. Do you see the highlights? Okay. Pink is about him. Yellow is about you. But look what it says. For my own name's sake and for the honor of my name. That's the motivation. That's the motivation. I will hold back my anger and not wipe you out. There's churches that are talking about that God is crazy about you. I'm not going to doubt that he doesn't love you. I know he loves you. But listen, he's angry. And nobody wants to hear this. But listen, when he made you, he didn't make you to be the way you've been. You've been active rebellion against him forever, including me. And yes, he loves you, but that doesn't make him happy that you're sinning and sinning and sinning and breaking his law and, and disobeying his spirit's leading and ignoring him and not acknowledging who he is. That doesn't make him happy. He's angry. And, and he's, a, he's a just God and he's a powerful God. And if he wanted to wipe you off the face of the earth, he could. And he has every right to do it. You're the creation. He's the creator. And you messed up and so did I. And he could, if he really wanted to, he could be like he did in the days of Noah. I'm done with all of you. But look, I will hold back my anger and not wipe you out. However, I have refined you. It's hot in the refiner's fire, isn't it? So he's working on you. He's changing you. He's helping you. But he's angry. Rather, I have refined you in the furnace of suffering. He's helping you. Do you see the things that it said in the Psalms? Forgiving your iniquity, leading you, guiding you. He's doing things for you. He's gracious. He's helping. He loves. He gives. He's refining you. He's changing you. Look, I will rescue you. Right? If you've been saved, hallelujah, right? Praise God. I'll rescue you, he said. Why? Because I'm crazy about you? For, my name. For not my name's sake. Right, that's the truth. That's who God really is. We need to get over this notion that he's happy and all in love and Valentine's Day and little cupids flying around in heaven on, on clouds with harps. That's not the way it is. He's an angry God who could wipe out the whole creation right now because we have failed him. He does love us. He's upset. Listen, if you're a mom and a dad, you know exactly how God feels right now. Yep. Right? You love your kids, but when they disappoint and they disobey, angry. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Yes, it is. <clears throat> I will rescue you for my name's sake. Yes, for my own sake. I will. Listen. <laughs> I will not let my reputation be tarnished. And I will not share my glory with idols. That's why he's good to you. The, 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 the blessing of, of, from God in any area of your life is a byproduct of him doing things for his own namesake. Like, that, that should... That is awesome. Like, it might not be what you've always heard, but I don't know about you, but when I heard that, I felt like I could exhale. That's the whole idea of, of if you're faithless, he's still faithful. Like, because 
Listen, you're a failure. You, I have made you to be this way, and you have failed me. But because you're made in my image to be like me, I ain't going to let that fail. I'm going to work it out. And it's because of my reputation. I'm not going to look bad to nobody. I'm God. So I'm going to hook you up, and I'm going to work on you, and I'm going to improve you, and I'm going to lead you, and I'm going to guide you, and I'm going to save you. I'm going to do it for you. But listen, it's for my name's sake. It's for my reputation. It's for my praise. It's for my glory. Never, ever forget that. He cannot deny himself. This is what the Word of God says of his faithfulness. And so, just about done. When the preacher gets up and he quotes Matthew chapter 6, that says, listen, this Father, this God, he already knows what you need. And if you'll seek him first, you put his kingdom first, like put everything else aside. I want you to just totally trust in me. He's like, I want you, if you just trust in me completely, I'll take care of all your needs. That's tough. It's tough, right? All of us can admit that is hard. It's very, very hard. We can hardly count on something we can see, not to mention the things we can't see. And so to be able to read that and to have any type of success in that at all, it's going to require faith on our behalf in his faithfulness to himself. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? The only way we can actually hear that verse and live it out is if we truly begin to trust in his faithfulness more and more. And so we have to look back and see the things that he has done, not only in your own life over the years and in the lives of the people around you, but we look back in the scripture and we look and see his faithfulness. We see, it, we see his word promised, and then we see his faithfulness displayed. And that's what we're going to do for the next six or seven weeks. Amen? Amen. Awesome. So a little bit shorter tonight than normal but that, I hope, is the framework for what we'll be doing the next, like I said, six or seven weeks, okay? So let's, let's, let's stand and let's, let's pray together and let's ask the Lord to, to bless our time together, not only here for the rest of the night, but over these next six or seven weeks as he downloads into you who he is and, and we see stories of his great faithfulness. We want, listen, this is what we want. We want to be able to trust him, right, at greater levels. We want to be able to have more faith in this God. And we want, we want to be conformed into his image so that not only can we trust God more, but other people can trust us more, right? Amen? If that's your prayer, right, just, just lift your hand and just talk to the Lord here, right here. Just, let's, let's just join together, and then we're going to sing of his faithfulness. I know you're eager to sing of his faithfulness, but Father, we thank you, Lord, for, the, for your message. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness you've displayed in our lives. If we would stop right now and just ponder the things and the times that you've shown up in our life, you promised you'd take care of our needs, and then you just do it, and you do it again, 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 and then we fail to remember that you did it, and we lose our trust in you again. But Lord, I, my prayer for this church right here, right now, is that during this study, during this time together, that this group of people here at Revolution Church and whoever might be watching online with us, that, Lord, that this study would break the cycle of doubt and help our trust and our faith in you increase to levels that we've never experienced before. So that when you say that you know all that we need, and that if we would seek first your kingdom, that means going after you with everything we've got and advancing the kingdom to other people with everything that we have. If we would do those things, that you would take care of all of our needs. We want to trust you in that, right? Yeah. But Lord, sometimes we don't. So like it says in the word, I believe. But help me with my unbelief. And Lord, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that this study would be a turning point in our life. That no longer would we have doubt but we would have great faith in your faithfulness. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's what you want, amen. Now let's sing to the Lord. Amen.